Good morning. After morning. All right. Well, welcome to Calvary Baptist Church uh, for uh, the purpose of studying and learning more about our awesome God. Let us join together in prayer as we begin. Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for the work you do. We thank you because you are awesome, powerful. Your word is true, and we are blessed. I pray, Lord, that your will be done this very night, that you touch our hearts and our lives. Bless Michael as he presents. In Christ's name we ask, amen. And with no further ado, as they say, let's get right into this. So you heard that we're looking at something called continuous environmental tracking. How many of you have heard of the term continuous environmental tracking prior to getting anything about this talk? Okay. I know who the informed people are. It's okay. You know, when you're done here tonight, my hope for everybody is that you will realize that, you know what, you don't, you never have had to be a trained PhD scientist to understand the basics of how science works. You make observations, you test things, and you compare it to other observations in the known world. I'm still getting a humming, buzzing, reverberating type sound here. That's a little bit better, I think. So, the talk tonight is going to explore some, it's, it's I, I don't really, feel like I can use the term cutting edge, okay? Um, but this is a development that's, that's beginning to gain a lot of traction in the creation ministry movement, okay? And more and more people are going to, you know, as they, as they see this and embrace this and understand the, the elegance and the simplicity behind it, okay, then uh, it makes studying biology, I think, more fun, more dramatic, and certainly more glorifying to God. And that is what we're here to do this weekend. All right, so continuous environmental tracking, a Bible-based alternative to natural selection. Understanding how organisms adapt to their environments in order for them to fulfill the mandate to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And who was it that gave the command to be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth? It was the Lord God, okay? He said it to Adam in the beginning. He said it to Noah after the ark, okay? So now for simplification, we'll use, if you hear me say CET, okay, that means continuous environmental tracking. Not to be confused with CRT. That's the other thing that's going on that we don't have to worry about. CET. Instead of constantly exposing the flaws regarding Darwin's theory of evolution, of which there are many, CET provides a tool or framework for research that allows Bible-believing scientists and laypersons to, quote, go on offense. And as we touched on last night, going on offense doesn't mean to, you get to be offensive. It means you get to take the argument back to the culture. To make a much stronger and sounder case for discovering and understanding the truth about how all living things adapt to their environment. Does that sound good or what? Okay. So... Let's start by asking this question. Can employing engineering principles to the study and analysis of living organisms and their ability to adapt to environmental changes provide a better explanation for those changes than the use of the term natural selection? Now, in short, I'd have to say yes. Otherwise, why would I have put this whole presentation together, right? So basically, we're going to study God's critters from an engineering perspective. And you say, well, wait a minute, I, I don't have any degree or background in engineering. I'm not, I don't design things. I'm not, you know, whatever. I'm not myself. I, my major in college was education. Uh, the closest thing I have to an engineering was the year and a half I took of mechanical drafting in high school, back with triangles and 4-H pencils and stuff like that, right? So you don't have to have an engineering degree. But understanding basic engineering principles isn't as hard as you might think. We just have to remember to put on our biblical glasses. So we're going to examine some aspects of engineering and then see how that integrates and applies to 
myology. But first, audiovisual check. Which one's going to come up today? Oh. This there are many questions about the history of the Earth. What major events might have occurred to shape it? Was there a global flood? A big bang? How did the Earth become filled with so many amazing and diverse creatures? I'm Del Tackett, the creator of The Truth Project, and I've spent a year asking a wide variety of scientists to help me better understand the world we see around us. Well, it was a story that we all learned in grammar school. Colorado River, over tens of millions of years, cut the Grand Canyon. Most geologists have jettisoned that idea. You can't imagine a canyon enduring that long with erosion. Time is not a magic wand that solves all the geologic problems of the world. The past is the key to the present. You want to understand why the way the world is today, you've got to understand what happened in the past. You take the present processes and extend it into the past, not unreasonable, but there's evidence in the rocks themselves that you can't do that. If the fossils of dinosaurs have been dated incorrectly, then it's very likely the fossils of any organism have been dated incorrectly, and therefore then the geologic ages themselves are incorrect. I believe in change over time, but I'm not an evolutionist. The shark has the ability to change, to adapt, to respond dynamically to the environment, but there are still sharks. I asked the other night how many people had seen this video, and several responded by saying yes, but we'd like to get everybody on board with that. So maybe at some future point we can talk about, you know, having a movie uh, situation where we can see it. It's a, it's a little over an hour long. Del Tackett interviews several scientists and he has them give their best explanation as to why creation model is a better, more accurate, more truthful representation of reality than the evolutionary paradigm. All right, so. Hang on a second, I've got to get my cursor back over here. We did that. So, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Randy Galuza. If you have not seen his picture before or heard his name, he is current president of the Institute for Creation Research. This is their logo. Let me tell you a little bit about him. He has a Bachelor of Science in Engineering from South Dakota School of Mines and Technology, a Bachelor of Arts in Theology from Moody Bible Institute, an MD from the University of Minnesota, and a Master of Public Health from Harvard University. He's not a knuckle-dragging brute either. He served nine years in the Navy Civil Engineer Corps and is a registered professional engineer. In 2008, he retired as a Lieutenant Colonel from the Air Force, where he served as 28th Bomb Wing Flight Surgeon and Chief of Aerospace Medicine. He then joined Institute for Creation Research as their national representative and was appointed as the ICR president in 2020. He's authored several books. He's contributed to several others. He appears in several DVDs. And in July of 2016, Dr. Galuza began to propose a model for Bible-believing scientists and others if they want to, to guide biological research based on the engineering principles he learned uh, as, uh, as an engineering major. Okay, and it was stemming from this question. Have living things been engineered for life or is all life just a cosmic, biological, against all odds accident? Remember how the other day we said to the evolutionist, the diehard evolutionist has to believe that only time, space, matter, and energy are what compose everything. There's no organizing force, no organizing mind to anything, okay? So it's going to be an all or nothing slot here, okay? It's either going to be engineered or it's going to be everything just came about by happenstance, by chance. Oh, wait, we ruled out happenstance and chance the other day. All right, okay, so... So Dr. Galuza, in his understanding this framework, advocates the fact that the term natural selection should not be used by creationists. And there are many people uh, that understand this and agree with him. And there are several people, okay, as young earth creationists, they say, you know, we really shouldn't move away from that term because it might confuse the argument. It, maybe it's just a semantic argument. Uh, people generally understand what natural selection is. And we can, we can 
respect their opinion, okay? And, and I'm not saying that by the end of this talk today, tonight, that, that you have to agree with that position, but that's part of what he puts together. Because as I'm going to show you, uh, the term natural selection really is kind of invalid, okay? Why do I say that? Well, what Dr. Galuza prefers that we understand it as engineered biology. Now, why does he say this? He says this because if we consider this illustration here, we have an organism that lives in an environment. And at the organism environment interface, it is the organism that does all the adapting to the environment. The environment does not shape or mold or select for or select against a critter, OK? We good on that? OK. So we're going to represent continuous environmental tracking with the environment is being nature, and with this uh, radar antenna, which we have CET initials on there. OK, continuous environmental tracking. So what does this mean? It means that organisms, plants and animals, have innate systems engineered into them to track the environment and to make adaptive changes as necessary. Did you catch in the video when they had the sharks swimming around? And uh, um, Dr. Carter, Robert Carter, is saying, you know, I believe in uh, adaptation, but I'm, you know, I'm, a, I'm a creationist. He says, the shark has the ability to adapt, to respond dynamically to the environment. But they're still sharks, OK? I love the way he says it. Yeah, but they're still sharks, OK? So they're adapting, they're changing. But no non-shark critter has ever been demonstrated to change into a shark-type critter, OK? No reptile-type critter has ever been demonstrated to, to uh, adapt into a non-bird-type critter, OK? Or non-reptilian, or whatever it is. They, they don't change. So you can, they can modify, they can adapt, so they can fill the command to be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. Now, I mentioned the other day that Darwin, in his book on the origin of species, and we looked at the title, and it's uh, by means of natural selection, but then the secondary title is, or the preservation of favored races in the struggle of life, and, and we could spend a whole hour just going over Darwin's racist views and sexist views as well for you ladies, okay? Uh, in chapter four of this book, Origin of Species, he says this, it may be metaphorically said that natural selection is daily and hourly scrutinizing throughout the world, every variation, even the slightest, rejecting that which is bad, preserving and adding up that which is good, silently and incessantly working where, whenever and wherever opportunity offers at the improvement of every organic being. I want you to please notice the action verbs that he attributes to nature. He says that nature is scrutinizing, rejecting, preserving, adding up, incessantly working. The concept of nature, he says, is responsible for these types of things. He's attributing nature, in other words, with volition, the ability to make a choice, natural selection. Is nature making a choice here in this situation? Well. Let's go to Romans chapter 1, verse 25. And it tells us, For they, being the skeptics, exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. This is from the New American Standard Bible, but if you read it in the New English Translation, it reads, They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served the creation rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. You see... It must be noted first and foremost that Darwin knew essentially nothing about the cell or about genetics. The discovery of DNA came 93 years after his book on the origin of species was published and uh, 71 years after Darwin died. So he believed that at the time, and most leading scientists did as well, that the cell was just a simple blob of protoplasm. It just kind of gave you structure, okay? And it really didn't do anything. Well, we know now, thanks to electron microscopy and genetics and being able to really go inside and see how each cell operates, it's like a miniature city, okay? And you have 
couple billion of them right now, producing, distributing, transporting, doing all kinds of things, maintaining your body temperature, everything else, respiration, all that good stuff, okay? All these are activities that are going on that Darwin knew nothing about. So he's talking about how animals and critters adapt when he really doesn't have a clue as to how they adapt. He attributes to the environment creating stresses on the creature, which then causes it to change. Natural selection acts only by taking advantage of slight successive variations. She, oh, he even gives her a feminine pronoun, can never take a great and sudden leap, but must advance by short and sure, though slow, steps. It's by means of natural selection, 19, or 1859, page 162, he says this. Now, reiterating a point that he makes a little earlier, he says this. If it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed, which could not possibly have been formed by, catch these, numerous, successive, slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. So this is what has been known as the falsification test. Darwin is saying, if you can show an example of any organ that exists that could not have formed slowly and gradually in a very, very minute step by step by step by step by step by step process, his theory would what? It would be called into question? No, it would absolutely break down. So numerous, successive, slight modifications. You're going to see that again a few times more in this talk tonight. To suppose that the eye, with all its inimitable contrivances for adjusting the focus to different distances, for admitting different amounts of light, and for the correction of spherical and chromatic aberration, could have been formed by natural selection, seems, I freely confess, absurd in the highest degree. Well, this is him speaking. He says it was absurd. Well, we might agree with that. It is absurd. Now, he had no observational data to support this. His Conclusions were being guided by his philosophy, okay? He wanted to try to come up with an explanation that would paint God out of the picture. And so when he sees little changes, he says, well, well, if we just give it enough time, we could just extrapolate and this little Galapagos finch can turn into a Galapagos elephant, okay? I mean, he didn't say that, but that's the thinking behind Darwin's approach. If we just... We, we see these little changes going on with the shape of the beaks or the length of the wings or whatever. Well, you give it a couple million years and you can have a whole different type of, type of creature. Uh, another way to put it, if you like, is... Oh, wait, let's back up here. Get one more. Chapter 4, on, on the origin of the species entitled Natural Selection. In it, Darwin makes several allusions to human breeders breeding for specific traits in pigeons and other animals. And then he uses that to make this unbounded extrapolation. And so what he's saying is that basically, if you give it enough time, pond scum can become a public speaker. <laughs> I, cho I choose not to buy that. Thank you very much. Okay. Darwin attributed characteristics of volition the thinking, conscious decision-making, upon nature that nature simply does not possess. His comparison to human breeders selecting for desired traits is faulty in that making an abstract comparison to human volition does not endow nature with that trait. In other words, just saying it doesn't make it so. Yes, human breeders can breed pigeons to do different things, travel different distances and perform other things, whatever, and homing pigeons and stuff like this. But then just to say, well, nature can do that too doesn't make nature to do that. And there was never any observational evidence. This was all coming from his philosophical background or his bias or his worldview, as we talked about last evening. So then, how does the model of continuous environmental tracking better explain the ability of organisms to adapt? Well, first, let's go back again and look briefly at God's original dominion mandate. Genesis 1.22, and God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let fowl multiply in the earth. This is at the beginning of creation. In verse 28, he says, Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Now, this is referring to the birds and the fishes, of course. In verse 28, he refers to the land-dwelling animals, and then we have Noah, and we have the flood. So in Genesis... Chapter 8, we have 
God again speaking, saying, Bring out with you every living thing of all flesh that is with you, birds and cattle and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, so that they may abound on the earth and be fruitful and multiply in, on the earth. So after the flood, again, the whole purpose for Noah to build the ark and house the critters was so that they could repopulate the earth after the flood. Okay? Now, we know that creatures do, uh, you know, um, move around and, and almost, well, pretty much every space on the planet is filled with something, even in deep sea vents where there's no light and very little heat, well, essentially none. There are still critters that live down there, okay? Microscopic type critters, but critters that exist nonetheless. And at the same time, we know by our own observation and even by common sense that not every organism is suited to live in every single environment on planet Earth, okay? Uh, personally, I am not suited to live in Antarctica with emperor penguins. And that's okay, you know why? Because I don't think penguins would like living in Heber Overgard either, okay? <laughs> not enough fish for them there, okay. So not all creatures detect and or respond to the same stimulus in the same way. Let me give you just a brief example. Let's just suppose that somewhere in the lovely desert of Arizona, you have a man who decides to go out and walk his dog. Now, in that area, there happens to be somebody, you know, we won't, we won't try to put a specific age or gender to this person, but they decide to blow a dog whistle. Okay, one of these critters is going to respond to the dog whistle and another will not. Why is that? Because one of them has sensors that are able to detect the frequency of the dog whistle, and the other one does not have sensors that are able to detect the frequency of the dog whistle. Okay, and the dog, as we know, is the one who will, and what will the dog probably do? He'll probably look up and perk around and, try to, and maybe he'll start tugging at the leash, whatever, and the owner will be like, what are you doing? What are you doing? What's going on here? Okay, because he didn't hear the dog whistle, but the dog did. So the dog is going to respond to its environment. Now, that's not adaptation. I admit that, okay? But I want to talk, but I want you to understand the part about the sensors, about detecting the environment, okay? Now, again, what brings us to the question? It, the same is true for design, success, or failure in the biological world, okay? If you have a critter that has the sensors to be able to detect changes, then it will or will not have the programming to adapt to that change that's, that's required. Uh, and, and, and some things do adapt and some things don't adapt. We do know that some critters on this planet have been going extinct. In fact, the extinction rate is just every so often we get the endangered and, the, and then they goes extinct, okay? Uh, extinction is part of living on a cursed planet. So let me ask this question. If it was God's plan for critters to adapt, then would he not also have also given them the ability to adapt to the differing environments, ecosystems that they would encounter in the post-flood world? Okay, is this reasonable or unreasonable? Well, if God said, this is what I want you to do, he's not gonna say, and good luck, okay, critters, go out there and figure out a way to adapt to whatever sort of environment you happen to find yourself in. I think it's very reasonable for us to all say, well, yeah, if God wants them to do this, then he has to give them the ability to do this. Now, uh, the, the, the thing about uh, Dr. Robert Carter, okay, talking about sharks, again, from, uh, from his Genesis history. I believe in change over time, but I'm not an evolutionist. The shark has the ability to change, to adapt, to respond dynamically to the environment. But there are still sharks. And when we look at the fossil record, there are still sharks. They can respond dynamically to their environment, but there are still sharks, okay? The changing thing, the becoming one kind of creature to another kind of creature doesn't happen. But that brings us then full circle around to Romans 120. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. Now this expression, what has been made, shows up one other time in the Greek in the New Testament. It is found in Ephesians 2, chapter 10, 
where it says, We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we could walk in. Oh, he prepared beforehand. Okay, so the idea of workmanship denotes that a workman has crafted or created something. Workmanship involves an act of producing something that people say, oh, look at that piece of workmanship. So when we look at Romans, we say, oh, so we should be able to understand from what God has made, his workmanship, so that what? So that people are without excuse. Well, we know that people are going to try to come up with excuses. But who is going to see God's workmanship? Everyone. Everyone is going to see God's workmanship. But some, because they want to hold to a philosophical worldview that says, no, 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 you don't, really want, you don't want to believe in God. I mean, he's going to hold you accountable for your life. Okay? Ignore the fact that his son came and died for your sins. And, you know, you don't, want to, you don't want to be involved. You don't want to be a, a God person. You, know? you don't want to be one of those kind of people. And there are people who then would say, oh, yeah, I guess, you know, I, I want these people to like me, so I guess I will, you know, not adapt a Christian worldview, a Christian lifestyle, they don't have any interest in wanting to defend God's word or even really truly believe God's word. But we have an opportunity to help them, and we can help by gently and graciously saying, hey, there's another way to think about all of this. No one has any excuse for not seeing God's workmanship in the things of nature and not giving him the praise he is due. All right. Bring you back around to Dr. Galuza. He writes this. Human engineers know they must build dynamic machines to create, to relate to dynamic environments. If human engineers can use a tracking system to detect and maintain the surveillance of a moving target, say, for instance, could creatures employ a similar overall strategy that utilizes different types of mechanisms to track changing conditions? The essential well-matched elements underlying the self-adjustable property of tracking systems are, okay, and we're going to start really getting into this now. One, input sensors to gather data on external conditions. Two, internal programming that specifies reference values and logic segments that compare input data to a reference and select a suitable response. Oh, where's the selecting going on? Within the organism. And three, output actuators to execute responses. The route from condition to adaptation runs through these components, and the removal of any one stops self-adjustment. Research demonstrates, and it does, that organisms have these same elements and utilize them to track changing conditions and produce specific results. That sounds like something I'd expect an engineer to say. All right, so just for review, and we're going to see these a lot tonight. You need input sensors to detect changes in the environment. You need internal programming to compare input data to reference values and select a suitable response. And you need three output actuators to execute the specific responses to the programming, to the input from the sensors. OK, are we good so far? Three things. You've got to be able to sense the environment. There has to be a logic program built in to say, when, when you get hot, oh, yeah, I'm going to button my shirt. Or take a fan. Or turn up the air conditioning. OK? So you have a sensor. You have a program response. But you can program your own response. You can say, well, I'm going to turn on the fan, or turn on the AC, or just go outside. Or you know, there's a lot of different things that we can do to adapt to our environment. Critters. As, as far as adapting to their environment, okay, a lot of it is done at a subconscious level. The creature just does it because that's what it's designed to do. So, the engineering principles that underlie how human design things self-adjust to changing environments is the most expedient way to explain how organisms adapt. Because they have input sensors, they have internal programming, and they have output actuators. Now, I have a short video here that I think will help to really kind of drive this home for us, OK? This is something that Subaru came up with several years ago. So it's kind of old, but it's very, very relevant to the discussion tonight. It is through 50 years of daring that we have been able to offer drivers peace of mind. 
50 years of designing cars for crash survival that led us to our most revolutionary feature yet. A car that can see trouble and stop itself to avoid it. Okay, I want you to permit, we're gonna, we're gonna let some creative imagination here go. Suppose that you were an engineer working for Subaru and you put this out and a friend of yours says, ah, I know how you came up with that. It was take your kid to work day and you brought your teenage kid to work and uh, then you got called to some tech uh, department meeting and you had to leave him alone for a while so you took him into a back room and you said, here, here's a box of electronic parts and a soldering iron. Just put some stuff together to keep yourself busy until I get back from my meeting. And you came back from your meeting and you looked at it and you said, wow, this is amazing. I know what this thing can do. We'll put it in the cars and it will prevent crashes. If you were a Subaru engineer and somebody tried to pawn that story off on you, you would be insulted. Because that's rather insulting to say, oh, you created this in very complex system for a car to be able to activate its own braking system to avoid wrecks, and it just happened. Oh, wait, we talked about just happening, not being a valid scientific theory. That is a philosophical statement. All right? What is it that these cars from Subaru have to have to be able to stop? They have to have input sensors to detect oncoming obstacle. They have to have internal programming to analyze the distance and velocity and determine the exact time to activate the brakes. And they need output actuators to execute a braking sequence. So we see these engineering principles employed in human design engineering systems. Can we take this concept into biology and look for the same types of things? You're probably saying, oh, I hope so. I came all the way here to hear about how this works. <laughs> design proofing, con design promoting concepts have advanced primarily by one, detailing the total insufficiency of the Darwinian mechanism. Two, exposing colossal hurdles for evolution, such as the Cambrian explosion, which, if you want to study fossils, it's the sudden emergence in the lowest sedimentary layers of all the different forms of life with no precursors, no preliminary life forms leading up to that. Three, highlighting many characteristics of organisms, especially their information content, and indi that indicate the work of an intelligent agent. We discussed that a little bit. And four, charting a rational approach for making a plausible inference to design. Charting a rational approach for making a plausible inference to design. But while it is valuable, this work isn't a clearly focused design-based structure for explaining adaptability. A design-based framework, if you please. And who design things other than God? Well, engineers do, okay? Darwin's view perceives organisms as passive modeling clay whose basic form is molded over time by their environments. Form is imposed on the organisms from without. Environments sculpt them into nature's diverse forms. The organism as modeling clay is the status quo assumption. This is how Darwin viewed organisms, how his book tried to get us to say, oh, nature is the agent and the organism is the critter being acted upon by the agent of change, which is the environment. And we're thinking, mm, there's got to be more, there's got to be more. It shapes the interpretation of results from studies focused on where the key action takes place. And I said that was the organism-environment relationship. That's the interface. It is the organism that does these changes, these adaptations. If the design-based model of adaptation, postulating that organisms continuously track environmental changes is correct, okay, if what we're saying here, continuous environmental tracking, is correct, that organisms Respond, they, they sense the environment, they, program, they run it through a program, and then they respond. If that is correct, it would emphasize organisms as active problem-solving entities, not passive modeling clay. It's a creature's self-adjusting innate mechanisms that produce change-suitable solutions that precede the changing conditions, which means they were already programmed into the critter before the critter encountered the environmental stimulus. Could it be possible that creatures actively track changing conditions rather than being passively pressured by them? This, again, this is from 
ICR or Galusa, engineered features, design, success, or failure. So instead of viewing organisms as a passive chunk of modeling clay, we're going to proceed by the premise that the organism tracks the environment and adapts itself accordingly. And to do that, it needs, what are the three things it needs? It needs, here we go, input sensors to detect the changes. It needs internal programming to compare that data with uh, reference values and then select a response. And it needs output actuators to execute those specific responses. It is the entity's traits, not its, six, not its exposure, that determine success or failure. This thing tells me it wants to reboot. You better not reboot right now. Okay. Engineered solutions to problems must precede the problem. The existence of a solution is not due to the problem. Okay. The, the, the existence of the solution is not due to the problem. The solution is programmed in as a variable to say, when you experience this, then you activate this output and you make this change. Now, before we go headlong into this, I'm going to ask you a question. What is faster than a speeding bullet, more powerful than a locomotive, and able to leap tall buildings in a single bound? And if you're anybody who's even close to my generation, you'd say, ah, yeah, we know that's Superman, right? OK, that's Superman. I'm going to ask you a different question. What critter can survive in space without oxygen, can survive exposure to radiation a thousand times greater than an Earth's surface, can withstand pressures six times greater than the deepest spot in the ocean? You're thinking, this creature doesn't exist. Oh, yeah. This creature can be dehydrated. Hang on can be dehydrated for over a century and return to normal activity when exposed to water and can persist in nearly boiling water and at temperatures approaching absolute zero. Who do you think it is? Oh my goodness. I love you already. OK. <laughs> Who is this creature? Tardigrade. A tardigrade. What on earth is a tardigrade? What the few biologists who study them have discovered, however, is that the secret of their survival is the ability to shut down their metabolism completely while maintaining their cellular structure. They have the ability to switch off all living processes and then start them up again. Now, the tardigrade, thank you, young lady, uh, this is a picture as seen through an electron microscope. It's also called a moss piglet or a water bear. The biggest adults may reach a body length of one and a half millimeters, the smallest below a tenth of a millimeter. Newly hatched tardigrades may be smaller than five one hundredths of a millimeter. A typical dust mite measures two tenths to 0.3 millimeters in length. Now, how would this tiny creature have been able to survive in all those different hostile environments unless it had been previously designed to do so? OK? It didn't happen upon him. I said, oh, I got to adapt ability to survive this. Oh, I got another. OK, I got to go adapt ability to survive this. Oh, I got it. You know, it's not going to happen. It's going it's, it's to die out before it can learn to adapt. OK? It had to have been designed to do so from the beginning. Did an early evolutionary ancestor just you know, happen to find itself there? And then it evolved all these modifications to survive there? You're thinking, ha, huh, I can't, I don't believe that. If natural selection and survival of the fittest were truly valid scientific theories, then why don't tardigrades rule the universe? If they can survive in all these different places. Now, they can survive in environments that humans can't even dream of being in for two seconds. Why have they not evolved into something more advanced than a simple tardigrade? OK, let's rephrase the question. Did nature select for this critter to survive? Or did it already possess the innate abilities to survive? Now, I stated earlier, continuous environmental tracking proposes a system, propose, proposes that a system needs to be designed ahead of time to respond to stresses in the environment, remember? And I say that, engine, that scientists should employ engineering principles to guide their research. Now, before we move on, uh, I, I would like to ask you later, maybe, how you learned about tardigrades. But 
tardigrades, they're interesting critters. They're showing up more and more in media and in culture, okay? Uh, as a matter of fact, you may have, uh, if you are a follower of Marvel Cinematic Universe, okay, and there was the Ant-Man, and then there was the sequel, Ant-Man and the Wasp. In the sequel, Ant-Man and the Wasp, a professor takes a little trip uh, into this quantum realm, and while he's in the quantum realm, he, he sees some tardigrades, all right? And so I just thought for fun, we'll put that on the video. Michael Douglas. Down to some microscopic so, if this wasn't interesting enough, okay, tardigrades are showing up in more and more places. In fact, there was a website called Budsies where you can buy a tardigrade plush toy. <laughs> awesome or disgusting, depending on how you want to look at it, okay? <laughs> You know, and uh, yes, you can create your own tardigrades stuffed toy. So yeah, tardigrades are interesting little critters. And they're getting more and more recognition because of their amazing ability to live in all these different environments. Incorporated in movies, they're made into plush toys. It's like, okay, come on. I showed you that one just to show you the likelihood of a tardigrade evolving all the abilities it needs to adapt to live in those environments couldn't have happened. It had to have been designed from the beginning to do that, okay? Design has to be incorporated in. It is an entity's traits, not its exposures, that determine the design success or failure. Engineered solutions to problems must precede the problem. The existence of the solution is not due to the problem. You've heard me say that. And I want to repeat it, though, because it really, uh, we, we, we want to leave here tonight and say, wow, I never knew so much about continuous environmental tracking. To help clarify the application of this approach to biology, we'll consider some examples of how design traits contribute to successful performance. I want to go back to the article by Dr. Galuza. When Hurricane Michael blew through Mexico Beach, Florida in October 2018, the homes in entire neighborhoods were flattened, but in one neighborhood, a single home surrounded by devastation was left virtually unscathed. A Fox News headline called it a miracle home, but miraculous explanations aren't needed. The home was engineered with traits, design features, specifically intended to solve the problem associated with hurricanes. This is a home in Mexico Beach, Florida, owned by a Dr. LeBron Lackey. It was designed or engineered to withstand winds of 250 miles per hour. He said later when interviewed, we intended to build it to survive, okay? So that begs this question. Did Dr. Lackey's home survive in October 18 because Hurricane Michael selected for his home and selected against all the others that were destroyed? What? A hurricane selecting for... Well, a hurricane is part of nature, natural selection. Did nature select for this home to survive or not? He said, that's absurd, that's ridiculous. And that's why Dr. Galuza says, we really can move away from using the term natural selection. A similar incident happened when an earthquake hit Kathmandu, Nepal, in April 25th of 2015. 9,000 people died. We would not say that the earthquake or nature selected for the building on the right and selected against the building on the left, okay? Now you might say, you're making these absurd comparisons here. Is that really valid, okay? I just want you to set the groundwork to saying, you know what? Yes, you can look and you can say, yeah, nature doesn't select. The building was either designed to withstand an earthquake or it wasn't. Dr. Lackey's home was either designed to survive a hurricane or it wasn't. All known creatures and human-engineered things have vulnerabilities. Since biological systems operate according to the same laws of chemistry and physics human engineers use to govern their designs, there should be a correlation to explain why even the most brilliant designs still have points of vulnerability. Not everything can be built to withstand every type of stress that comes along. Some critics of intelligent design equate poor design with the vulnerabilities of organisms. They believe that these vulnerabilities shouldn't exist if the creature were produced by an omnipotent, omniscient creator. But if we're looking for evidence of intelligent agency to explain the design found in creatures, then those designs should be held to the same standard by which we apply to marvelously designed things by human engineers. What is he saying? We can't expect every creature to live in every environment, just like we can't expect every machine to perform in every environment. Okay, uh, if I try to take my Toyota Tacoma pickup, okay, 
to Antarctica and drive it around on the ice, uh, it's not going to work. Okay, uh, it eventually it's going it, to once the engine cools down, it's probably not going to restart. Okay, just too cold down there for that engine to work. But it works fine around Hebrew Overguard. So an evolutionist might say, well, yeah, hey, it's not fair to compare a biological system to a non-biological system. Okay, they might say that's like comparing apples to John Deere tractors. So let's answer this charge by looking at biological systems with the engineering perspective to see what really fits. Dr. Gluza goes on to say, engineers usually add a safety factor that enables what they've designed to withstand exposure to somewhat outside these parameters. Even so, they know that given an excessive exposure, the entity will eventually fail. That failure, however, is not indicative of a faulty design. Okay, so God doesn't design faulty things, but everything has a limit to which it can stand up. Faulty designs specify features from the outset that are unable to withstand the exposures necessary to meet the design's intended purpose. I think of George Burns, right, the comedian. He smoked cigars and still lived to be how old? And there are some young people who start chewing tobacco and get cancer within a few years or emphysema or something else. Something about George Burns' lungs just, he could handle it, okay? Other people, not so much. Thus, even homes that were flattened by Hurricane Michael were not necessarily poorly designed or shoddily constructed. No. Since they lightly withstood prior hurricanes, they probably just were not designed to ever resist one of Michael's force. We call that, what was it? We know that engineers don't design things that will have unlimited resources to build them. Even sophisticated designs are expected to operate only within various ranges of different exposures. These ranges are called the design parameters. Design parameters. If, you're, if you don't even have to be an engineer, but you probably understand a little bit, it's like, yeah, you, you know, plastic toys are going to break more easily than metal toys. You know, we had, you know, we had really nice, you know, the metal Tonka trucks when we were little, and now, and not so much. I don't think, you know. Uh, and the kids are playing more with Legos anyway, so. The same is true for organisms. When one of their appendages or organs breaks because it was exposed to conditions outside its design parameters, like lungs, okay, it reflects a situation in which design parameters were exceeded rather than a faulty design. Why would anyone think that creatures should have design parameters that could never be exceeded even if designed by an omniscient creator? Okay, critters, not every critter can live in every place. So the question before us today, as we look at just a few of God's critters is, is an organism's ability to adapt best understood as modeling clay or as incredible super critters, super critters with awesome design? All right, and in addition to those other three things we mentioned, these responses to the environment are also, here's four of them. They are regulated as opposed to random, they are rapid as opposed to long, slow, and gradual. They are repeatable in terms of being predictably consistent. When we do this to this critter here, it does this. And we do it to that same critter over there, or a different critter of the same type over there. OK, and we see how that works. And they are targeted to address the need of the organism. They're not just kind of random. So let's start. Now we're going <clears> to <throat> shift gears. We're going to start really getting into looking at some critters. So we're going to start off by looking at Frogs. No, not this guy. No, no, not him. Frogs. Uh, well, he's cute, but no, not him either. Uh, that I'm not sure what we do with. Maybe this guy here. Okay, yeah, the wood frog. Okay, wood frog. He has two scientific names, something, something, and something, something else. <laughs> the only frog discovered living north of the Arctic Circle. In the winter, the wood frog goes into extreme hibernation. To prevent cellular destruction from freezing the frog, he goes on a sugar high by manufacturing high levels of glucose in his body. The glucose lowers the freezing point of the frog and provides enough energy to keep the cells alive. The glucose also inhibits metabolic reactions like urea production from taking place. High glucose levels would normally kill the frog, except that this glucose spike only occurs just before the frog freezes. How is that?
When ice crystals first start to form on the frog's skin, a message travels to the frog's liver to convert much of its stored glycogen into glucose. Five minutes after the signal is received, the sugar level in the frog's blood begins to increase. During this period, the heart stops beating and the lungs quit functioning. It takes about a day for the wood frog to thaw, starting from the inside and moving outwards. The signals that stimulate the heart to start beating again and the lungs to start working are still unknown. So they haven't quite got it all figured out yet. But what do we have here? We have input sensors to detect the ice on the frog's skin. We have internal programming to determine that it needs to engage the output actuators to trigger the cascade of processes to flood the frog with glucose. Now, like I say, the researchers understand how he gets himself into this cryogenic state, but they don't know yet how it's reversed, okay? Now, remember what Darwin said, oh, excuse me, back up. If it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. So what happened to those early frogs? You know, oh, they froze to death. Well, if they freeze to death the first winter, they're exposed, no more frogs, no evolution, no adaptation. And these responses are what? They are regulated, they are rapid, they are repeatable, and they are targeted, all right? There's another critter I'm going to take a look at next. This guy here, not much to look at at all, is he? This is the Arctic springtail. Let me tell you some facts about the Arctic springtail. His scientific name is mm -mm, something Arcticus. I got the second part of it. It looks like an insect, but it is actually an arthropod. Okay? Average size is 2 tenths of an inch long. They spend the spring and summer in the mossy areas of the Arctic. When the temperature drops to a certain point, the springtail begins shedding its internal water in a process known as cryoprotective dehydration, CPD. In the spring, the springtail rehydrates itself and goes about its business. Here is a picture of the dehydrated Arctic springtail, and in the upper right-hand corner is the fully hydrated version. And this thing will go through the winter just like that. And then in the springtime, he rehydrates, or she rehydrates. I guess you have to have both of them rehydrating, right, if they're going to mate and have more babies. What does this critter need? It needs to have input sensors to detect the colder climate conditions. It needs internal programming to distinguish a sudden cold snap from winter's actual onset. You can't have this thing going in a cryogenic preservation when there was just a little thing. Like, oh, now I got to reverse. Oh, wait, now I got to go back. No, I got to reverse. Okay? Because that burns up too much energy, too many resources. So it knows this is winter. We do this whole de dehydration process. And of course, you need the output actuators to activate the cryoprotective dehydration sequence in its body. Because the Arctic springtail, again, has to rehydrate itself in the spring, they're not quite sure if the critter has maybe just a built-in timer, or maybe it has input sensors to detect a warmer climate conditions. Yeah, but the creature's already shut down. It's already dehydrated. Could it still have sensors that work? Or maybe it has then, in that case, internal program to distinguish a sudden warm spell from spring's arrival, and then it would need output actuators to begin the hydro reabsorption from the atmospheric humidity. So it has to draw its water from somewhere, okay? So either the critter has a built-in timer that goes off, or it has another array of sensors that even when it's in its dehydrated state, it can still do this. We don't know yet. The fact that it has the set of sensors even to get it into dehydration is amazing enough, right? Either a built-in clock or the other. And what did Charlie say? If it could be demonstrated that any complex organism existed, which not could have possibly been formed by numerous successive slight modifications. Now, what's more reasonable, that or regulated, rapid, repeatable, and targeted? How many of you have ever considered corn? Corn, corn. How, does, uh, how on earth does corn employ continuous environmental tracking? You do want to know, right? OK. Sometimes corn fields are infested with caterpillars. A caterpillar invades a cornfield and begins munching on a particular corn plant in a field. 
the corn plant begins by re to releasing a volatile chemical compounds, which we know as pheromones, that are sensed by the other nearby corn plants in the field. The other corn plants begin to produce a different volatile compound that attracts parasitoid wasps to the cornfield. Parasitoid wasps means they're parasitic and they infect, okay? The wasps, what they will do is they will lay their eggs under the caterpillar's skin, and when the eggs hatch, the wasp larvae eat the caterpillar. Okay, so a corn plant that's getting attacked by a caterpillar releases pheromones that the other corn plants in the field pick up, and then they produce this other thing that attracts wasps. The wasps come to the cornfield, see the caterpillars, lay their eggs, and works on the, the uh, caterpillars. The corn plant does not respond to routine damage to the leaves by wind or hail. It knows when a caterpillar is eating it because the corn plant's defense is triggered by the presence of the caterpillar's saliva. Oh, it has to respond to a particular chemical stimulation. The compounds that attract the wasps do not have any effect on the ears of the corn. Okay, you can't have this other pheromone making the crop invalid. So what you have here is pre-designed organic pest control. Okay, pre-designed organic pest control. Two-stage organic pest control. And what do you need to have to make this work? You need to have input sensors on the plant to detect the caterpillar saliva. You need internal programming to recognize the threat as being distinct from routine damage by hail or wind. And then you need the output actuators to release the volatile compounds. And this is only on the corn plant that's being attacked because all those other corn plants have to have input sensors to detect the volatile compounds that are being released by the first plant, they have to have internal programming to recognize the compounds that are signaling attack by the caterpillars, and they need to have output actuators to release the volatile compounds to attract the parasitoid wasps. Bingo, bango, and then the caterpillars go bongo, okay? And what was Darwin's falsification test? Numerous successive slight modifications. Does that sound reasonable? Or does regulated, rapid, repeatable, and targeted sound like it makes better scientific observational sense? What about flowers? This is an evening primrose, and they react to honeybees. Dr. Gazelle, back in October, sp spoke about this in his talk on honey and the bees. In Creation Magazine, October 2019, there was an article by Dr. David Catchpool, who is a plant physiologist, and he wrote an article called Hear Bee Make Nectar, in which he writes this, not only can plants hear, but they can rapidly respond to certain sounds. New research, has sh new research has shown. When a recording of the sound of a bee buzzing nearby was played back to evening primrose flowers, they began producing sweeter nectar. Within only three minutes from the first sound exposure, which is the time the researchers had to wait to collect the quantity of new nectar required for their measuring equipment to even work, the concentration of sugar in the nectar increased by about 20% on average. After the plant, which doesn't have a brain, was exposed to the sound of a bee's humming. Bees can discern concentration differences as small as 1 to 3%. So even allowing for old nectar diluting the newer product, it would still be a significant incentive for bees to more regularly visit flowers of that species and to stay longer when they do, increasing the chances of pollination. The researchers found that the sound of buzzing bees caused the flower to vibrate. This suggests a key role of the flower, particularly the petals, in directly receiving or at least enhancing reception of the bee's sound. In other words, the flower functions like an ear, say the researchers. So the shape of the petals, the shape of the flower is designed to catch the buzzing vibration from the bee's wings and then turn on the process. The point of all this, as the researchers explained, producing high-grade nectar all the time would use a lot of the plant's resources, and exposing nectar is subject to degradation by microbes. So, a mechanism for timing the production of enhanced reward for the bees to a time when pollinators are likely to be present could be highly beneficial for the plant. Indeed so, a win-win for both species. 
the temporary boost in sugar content uh, lasted for up to six minutes. As pollinators, they said, were nine times more likely to visit a plant that had been previously visited by a pollinator within that time frame. So it attracts even more business, kind of like word of whatever advertising. So he continues, of course, the researchers attribute this to evolution, but describing an organism's hitherunto realized feature and its usefulness is not the same as explaining its origin. Rather, who'd have ever thought of a flower being akin to an ear? Answer, the one the Bible says made the flowers and the bees and everything else in this mind-bogglingly complex creation that continues to surprise and delight. And you can find this online at creation.com forward slash here be make nectars. So, what do flowers need? To do this, they need input sensors to detect the bee's wings vibrations. They need internal programming to recognize the vibrations as being within the frequencies relative to pollinators, not some other frequency. And they need output actuators to initiate the process of increased nectar, nectar production. That is amazing, especially if you like honey. Or, to borrow from the younger people, sweet. And what did Charlie say? He said, numerous successive flight modifications. And we say, no, rapid, regulated, rapid, repeatable, and targeted solutions. And while we're on the subject of plants, I want you to see this other article from this issue of Creation Magazine. This was January of 2019. Again, David Catchpool, again, as I said, he's a plant physiologist. He tells us that plants are listening well, we heard that flowers were listening. Plants are listening. A news release from the University of Western Australia announced that plants have far more complex and developed senses than we thought, with the ability to detect and respond to sounds. In particular, fascinating research has shown that seedling roots can hear the sound of gurgling water. Say what, you say? Researchers grew pea seedlings in pots shaped like an upside down Y, such that the roots had a two-way choice. They were selecting. They grew towards wet soil rather than dry soil. Well, that makes sense. Or they aimed for a tray of water instead of the dry soil. Okay. Remarkably, when one of the choices was a sealed pipe through which water flowed, seedling roots grew towards it rather than towards dry soil. Okay. So here's kind of an illustration of what that might look like. You've got the plant, and then the roots have this little chamber here. And the soil, the composition, the texture, the moisture is all the same. This one just has soil. This one has soil, but inside the soil is a pipe carrying water. And what did the roots do? Overwhelmingly grew towards the side with the pipe. They just knew the water was there, even if the only thing to detect was the sound of it flowing inside the pipe, explained lead researcher Monica Gagliano. No, no relative. And in the instance of wet soil being offered as an alternative, the plant roots grew towards it rather than the gurgling pipe. Well, that makes sense because they're detecting moisture. Well, we would expect plant roots to detect moisture. We don't expect them to detect sound. Prompting the researchers to surmise that plants use sound waves to detect water at a distance, but home, home in on actual moisture when it is there. Dr. Gagliano explained the research, indicates that the invasion of sewer pipes by tree roots may be based on the plants hearing water and shows that their perception of their surroundings is much greater and far more complex than we previously thought. Where did such impressive hearing ability come from? According to Dr. Gagliano and her co-workers, it is apparently attributable to evolution, but the staggering complexity of plants with these incredible sensory capabilities only now being un dis uncovered by scientists after years of painstaking research speaks powerfully of having been designed on day three of creation week. The Bible identifies this designer as our creator, Lord, and savior, Jesus. That's from creation.com forward slash plants are listening. And they're not just detecting the moisture like we see, but they can also detect the vibrations or the sound of flowing water somewhere underground. And so what do they need to do that? They need input sensors to detect the vibration of moving water. They need internal programming to recognize the frequency 
and related sounds as being produced by water, and they need output actuators to direct root development in the direction of the underground water source. And what did Charlie say? He said numerous excessive slight modifications, and we say regulated, rapid, repeatable, and targeted. Now, I gave this talk a couple, several weeks ago in Wickenburg, and the host that was having a stay at his house had a greenhouse. And on one wall of his greenhouse, he had a water uh, basin reservoir, and he had pipes taken up, and water would trickle down the side of this wall and go into a little, and it would be recirculated. On the other side of his greenhouse, on the outside, he had a tree of what nature I can't remember. And one day, he's in his greenhouse, and this thing is running like, you know, 24 7. And he noticed, and then the, the, the greenhouse had a ceramic tile floor everywhere throughout. But he noticed right at the edge, by this water, roots were coming up, cracking through the tile, and coming up and over and into this basin where this wall was. He's like, where are these roots coming from? He started thinking of what plant in here is producing these roots. And he started pulling them out because they were getting all over the place. Eventually, he had to dig up the floor, knock out the ceramic tiles, and realize that this tree over here was sending roots under the ground, way over here to the wall of water that it was listening to. And he was pulling me out. And so after he heard the talk, he goes, come here, I, I got to show you this out of my, in my, my greenhouse. This is so cool. This is exactly what you described. And at the same talk, a lady afterwards at the Q&A, she raised her hand. She goes, I'm from Kansas, and I know about the corn thing because, yeah, we studied this, and they do the thing, and then the wasps come, and they, and they sting the caterpillars and, and lay their eggs on them and stuff. She goes, yes, yes, I'll validate that. It's like, I didn't ask for that, but hey, it came. So very, very cool. Let's talk about this handsome feller here. This is the bluehead wrasse fish. Some interesting facts about them are the scientific name is Thassaloma bifasciatum. They live in and around the Caribbean. Unlike most fish, they swim mainly with their pectoral fins. They're a popular addition to saltwater aquariums. The larvae bury themselves in the sand until they emerge as juveniles, and they are very bold and may approach humans in the water. And they live in a, well, for want of a better term, harems. One male and several female concubines, if you will. Now, while that may seem interesting to a lot of teenage boys, not so great if you live in a situation like this, because why? The male is bigger and more colorful, and he has colorations that make him stand out and be a more tempting target for predators who might want to eat a fish. Okay, so that being said, what happens if the male bluehead wrasse is taken from the harem and devoured by some other sort of fish? What happens is a female from the harem transforms into a male. Now, in our current culture, <laughs> we have lots of talk about sexual identity and hormone therapies and gender reassignment surgeries and stuff like that. Human gender is determined by chromosomes. It's either XX or XY. Not so with these critters. This adaptation is achieved by means of something that's known as epigenetics. It's act, uh, there are markers that act on the DNA that activate some genes and suppress, suppress some others. Within minutes of the male's absence, the largest female in the group will begin the transformation process. Within 10 days, the ovaries have shriveled and testes are fully functional. Within 20 days, all anatomical features, colorations, marking, etc., of the male are complete. And this is just one species of fish. Researchers have identified more than 500 fish species that regularly change sex as adults. Clownfish begin life as males, then change into fields, and kobudai do the opposite. Some species, including gobies, can change sex back and forth. The transformation may be triggered by age, size, or social status. And, you know, hey, uh, you know, you don't have to take my word for it. These are other researchers saying this. Input sensors to detect the absence of the male. 
internal programming to recognize the input as requiring activation of the epigenetic sequence and output actuators to initiate and regulate the gender transformation process. Amazing. No hormone therapies, no gender reassignment surgeries. And what was Darwin's? Oh, numerous successive slight modifications. Or is it regulated, rapid, repeatable, and targeted? Well, what about... Ricola. No, not Ricola. E. coli. Now, it's amazing because E. coli, think about this, is only a one-celled organism. Okay? It has one cell. It has no brain. Okay? E. coli, in case you want to know, primarily live in our gut. And in, there's a whole bunch of them living inside yours right now. Most strains of E. coli are non-pathogenic. Okay? They don't cause any problems. In fact, they're very beneficial and necessary for us. But there are a few bad characters that show up once in a while. Those are the ones that have mutated. Mutations are not good. Okay? Most of the information about this critter that I'm going to share with you comes from the January, February, March issue of 2022, this year, of Creation Magazine. This is the cover of the print edition. It's also available in digital. I'll tell you more about that. Well, in fact, I'll tell you right here. I know you probably can't see this because it's kind of small. Uh, if you go to creation.com, you go to resources, you go to Creation Magazine, then you can subscribe and you can subscribe to the magazine and you can get it delivered to your house uh, four times a year. Good stuff, okay. This article uh, this is from the online version. I took screenshots from the online version. I need to give credit to the author. He uses the pen name David Thomas. He uses that pen name because this person is currently studying biological sciences at a particular university and he wants to avoid any unnecessary conflict with the university because if you ever saw intel uh, expelled no intelligence allowed you know that sometimes people will put things out there and suddenly they'll get their research funds canceled and their grants canceled and their tenure denied and everything else now the study of the e coli bacterium first became popular in the year 1996 when michael behe Professor of Biological Sciences at Lehigh University published his book, Darwin's Black Box, The Biochemical Challenge to Evolution. And he talked about the E. coli bacteria and he talked about just the motor, just the motor of the E. coli, he says, is irreducibly complex. It doesn't just assemble itself. It has to be built specifically at a certain, you know, certain um, sequence. And then it has to activate it. It has to do all these things. It's very complex. And you can't just strip away one part and have a, a working flagellar motor. Okay. So this person here who ran this article has done more research on the E. coli, and it really is pretty cool. But this idea of irreducible complexity fits in, and this is very elegant. He says, do you know that the simple bacterium E. coli swims through our gut using sophisticated nanoscale electric motors? Each of these motors spins a whip-like flagellum at the super high speed of up to 22,800 revolutions per minute. My Toyota Tacoma wouldn't dare attempt to get anywhere close to that. <laughs> Some bacteria reach 102,000 RPM. The spinning flagellum acts as a propeller. E. coli's motor is about 45 nanometers or, or 45 billionths of a meter wide. 2,000 of them could be lined up across the width of your human hair, and this is only 45 wide. Evolutionists have called it a remarkable nanomachine, a sophisticated rotary motor, and an example of elegance in molecular engineering. Yeah, elegance, okay. So now, let's look at this. This is, this is a one-celled critter, critter, right? No brain. The motor is composed of parts that perform similar functions to the ones found in human design motors. This includes gears, a rotor, axles, a drive shaft, bushings, a universal joint, and adapter rings. And just like our motors, the bacterial flagellum is powered by electricity. The bacterial cell membrane functions as a highly efficient capacitor that keeps positive and negative charges apart. This electrical difference is created by proton pumps that take hydrogen ions, protons. I know if this is sounding confusing and you're saying, I'm having a really hard time visualizing this. Bear with me, okay? This all leads us up to the design of how this thing does this. And remove them from the cell. These positively charged particles then flow back into the cell acting like electric current. It differs from a household electric current, which is a flow of negatively charged ions. 
All right, so here is a picture, if you've never happened to see one, of a bacterial flagellant motor. And each thing you see that's a different color is a different protein that has been used to build that particular structure. As these protons flow through the flagellar motor, they cause it to spin at the base of the motor. So how does this, how exactly does this, the projector, the, the flagellar motor spin? At the base of the motor is a central gear surrounded by up to 11 powered gears in other flagellated bacterial species, as many as 18. Okay, and I'm gonna show you a picture here briefly to ex illustrate how that works. The current flowing through the powered gears cause them to rotate, driving the central gear. The powered gears rotate around axles that are anchored to the cell wall. The rotor, connects the central gear to the drive shaft. It's made of an inner ring and an outer ring, an adapter ring and a socket that houses the drive shaft. Now notice the part says up to 11, sometimes 18, okay? And then it talks about the drive shaft moving through this and everything else and uh, the outer, drive, outer surface, very smooth, operated by a thin layer of fluid, very little friction, almost 100% efficient. 120 moving parts in the hook-shaped universal joint. This design makes it very resistant to twisting but flexible to bend. Two important requirements for an efficient universal joint. Well, we don't make motors that come anywhere near that level of efficiency. Okay, so the gear mechanism. Here is where we get really, really hairy. The motor has a two gear shifting mechanisms. One to change the direction of rotation and one to adjust power output. The motor switches between forward and reverse gear in less than a millisecond by changing the diameter of the top of the central gear. Now, how does that work? Here is how it works. These are the power gears, and you see they all rotate in this direction. Okay, now I have to start over this one. When they're rotating in this direction, it pushes the, the drive ring in a counterclockwise direction. When the flagellar motor senses that it needs to change direction, it simply pops this out and now it's on the outside, and these things are still turning the same direction, but now then that causes this drive gear to change direction. Boom, boom, in a fraction of a second. Now, you say, well, that's amazing, okay? You know, it's like a, it's like a clutch, it's poop, 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 and it changes gears. No, it actually doesn't need a clutch, it just engages, and, and it's kind of like, wow, it does its own thing. And it doesn't strip its gears, and it doesn't overheat, and it doesn't go crazy on you. Now, the second gear mechanism performs the same function as gears on a bicycle. If the cell swims into thicker fluid, it becomes harder to rotate the propellers, okay? It's like going from swimming in the water to swimming in the gravy. The motor detects this using torque sensors and automatically engages more powered gears with the central gear, increasing the rotational force produced by the motor. The opposite occurs if the cell swims into thinner fluid. This sophisticated gear mechanism makes the whole system extremely energy efficient since it doesn't use any more power than is needed. So it knows how to conserve its energy. So let's take a look at this again. It's swimming along just fine. Maybe it's going clockwise, maybe it's going counterclockwise. And it says, mm, I'm having a tougher time. One cell critter, no brain. It starts pulling in more drive gears to add more torque to get that central gear turning. It senses that it needs more torque. It brings in more torque. When it says, I don't need this anymore, it drops out so it can save energy. Only as much as it needs, only for as long as it needs, one cell critter, amazing. I could talk then a little bit about the motor construction and how it's built, but we're doing pretty good here. Uh, motor construction, he talks about the logic circuit, okay? And he drew a schematic of the logic circuit and it looks like, hang on a second here, get us through some of this stuff. Looks like that, that's his schematic of the logic circuit, okay? For the navigation system. Oh, what do we have here? Input sensors to detect the viscosity of the current fluid medium. Internal program to determine how many additional power gears are needed for the drive motors. And three output actuators to deploy or remove the additional power gears to the drive motors. I didn't even talk about whether it's going in a clockwise or counterclockwise. How does this thing know that it needs to go to some other direction that's gonna to have to change its motors? That's gonna change direction. Oh. I'm not sensing what I need. I don't sense a food source over here. Maybe I need to back up and go over this way. 
Okay, this is just the whole power thing. But then there is the navigation system, and this is a schematic of, of how the uh, researcher lays it out. He says, this is kind of like my best interpretation of how these, the sensor array looks. And it's just, and it's kind of abstract. But to navigate, to decide where it has to go, it needs input sensors to determine the chemical gradients in the surrounding medium. It needs internal programming to determine whether to navigate towards or away from those chemicals. Is this toxic or is it something I want? Three, output actuators to reverse the direction of whichever drive motors will get it where it needs to go. And what did Charlie say? Numerous successive slight modifications. What do we say? Regulated, rapid, repeatable, and targeted. So I think at this point, we can all tell Mr. Darwin, sorry, Charlie, the conclusion. The electric motors of many bacterial species are even more complex than the one found in E. coli with many extra parts, sometimes including a clutch or a brake. Many of the details in this article were only discovered over the last few years. No doubt many more fascinating discoveries will be made in the years to come. Bacteria are far from simple bags of chemicals. The function, control, and construction of E. coli's electric motor shows layers upon layers of sophisticated design and engineering. This motor brings glory to its designer, our creator, and our savior, I'm adding, Jesus Christ, Colossians 1, 16. Can we say amen to that? No. But I want to ask you, does the Bible have a falsification test for God? Well, I'm going to tell you that the answer is yes and no. It's more of a validation test, okay? And it comes from two scriptures. Jeremiah 29, 13, he says, you will seek for me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. And Hebrews 11, 6, and without faith it is impossible to please God because whoever comes to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. If anyone seeks after God sincerely and wants God to reveal himself in their life, God will make himself known. He will answer that request. Hebrews chapter 7 goes on to tell us, For the law never made anything perfect, but now we have confidence in a better hope through which we draw near to God. Drawing near to God. Hebrews 7.25, Consequently, he is able for all time to save those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for him. I will go so far as to say that God delights to make himself known whenever anyone seeks for him. And James 4, verse 8 tells us, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. This is just one of the many manifold promises of God that he will draw near to us if we choose to draw near to him. And I hope that this talk helps inspire you to all want to continue to draw near to God. Thank you very much. Q&A? Yes. All right. We've got time for a few. I've had you sitting for a while, trying to keep your brains from exploding as you're absorb absorbing all of these things. 